Raiders? Well, it's actually Chart of at a very, very low point. The early 20th century, things are booming in America, and when things are good, we tend to open up the doors, and also when people see how things are good, they want to be here. Uh, when you're finished watching this video, and watch the video all the way through to the end, please, it's going to help you out a lot. Uh, there's a brief quiz, a daily assignment quiz on Otis.com. It'll only take you a couple of minutes once you get there. Otis.com, take your quiz. Okay, so it's, a, it's a three simple questions. One question, three simple answers. And if you watch the video through to the end, it's easy peasy. So uh, don't uh, don't screw this up. Okay, so uh, past days we were talking about all this wealth and Mr. Buffett and all these rich guys. And, and if you p logged into the Zoom uh, today, and, and a lot of you didn't, or on Monday, a lot of you didn't. I had less than half, which is very disappointing and sad to me. I like seeing you there. Uh, we talked about how Im almost impossible it would be to spend the kind of money that someone like Bill Gates or or any of these people are making. So uh, the example I gave in the Zoom for just really quick reference, uh, every second of every day, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in the year 20, I think it was 2017 to 2018, Bill Gates' fortune improved by $3.2 billion. And just to put that into perspective, that's every second, not just every working second, uh, every second it's like a hundred and some dollars. That is crazy money to even imagine that kind of money. So I uh, should have logged into the Zoom because it's a pretty cool story. So when we look at immigration and, and urban growth, it all has to do with industrialization. So as cities begin to build more and more factories, it is dark out and a bumblebee just went past my head. That is weird. Anyway, maybe it was a bat or something, but it looked like a bumblebee. Just saw a shadow. Uh, population begins to shift to the cities because they need more workers. But the problem that keeps that from happening throughout most of history uh, is construction. And I'm going to get into that towards the end of this discussion today. So uh, most people lived in rural areas throughout all of history, with the exception of the last 80 or 90 years, maybe. Um, in fact, even if we go back 90 or 100 years ago, only about 3 to 5% of the population of the United States lived in urban areas urban meaning city, and the rest of the country, 95-96% lived in rural areas. We are a country that was formed agriculturally. We are a country of farmers, <clears throat> and it's been that way uh, since the colonies first developed. So uh, we see the growth in cities only as a result of a couple of things that are happening. Huge massive shifts in immigration, huge massive shifts in the, the increase in factory production and industrialization, uh, steel petroleum, automobiles, all of those things that are now a real thing in America are pushing growth in America. As a result, everybody that can be here wants to be here. We've talked about this before. Your ancestors that migrated or immigrated to the United States from somewhere else didn't leave where they were because things were great. You don't leave someplace that's great because it's great. You leave it because it's not going so well. So, there's sort of a, an image of America that's painted uh, to the rest of the world. And, and remember, this is before radio and television, and, and people could actually see what life was like here. In fact, I suppose in a lot of countries that's still true today. But there were a lot of mischaracterizations or misconceptions of what life in America would be like. For instance, this is one of my favorite, I don't know if it's a quote or an old Italian saying, but it says, uh, I came to America because I heard the streets were paved with gold. Now, that's a little bit of a, uh, an exaggeration, I think. I don't think anybody really believed the streets were paved with gold. When I got here, I found out three things. 
First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. So immigrants, when they came to America, and look at this family here standing here looking off in the distance at the Statue of Liberty, and, and here's the buildings. Ellis Island was a gorgeous, beautiful place, which has a really cool history of its own, but I don't want to go into too much detail, or this 15-minute video will turn into a 25-minute video really quick. But I'll, just a little history. It started out as a, a gull island, because gulls live there. At one point, it was called Oyster Island. At one point, it was sold to a fisherman who opened up a small restaurant on this island, and uh, in fact, it was a lot smaller than what Ellis Island is today. And uh, he had a small restaurant there for fishermen and he sold bait and stuff. Then uh, New York started digging out a subway system and they, they needed a place to dump garbage and, uh, and dirt from all of the tunnels they were digging. So they dumped it there and that's how the island became an island. But uh, to immigrants from all over the world in the early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, this was a, a beautiful thing to see. Freedom headed your way. So we look at the growth of these cities from shortly before the Civil War starts to 1900. Uh, New York City goes from 1 million people in 40 years to th almost 3.5 million people. Uh, same thing with Philadelphia from 565,000 to 1.3 million. Uh, all of the major cities in America were just exploding population-wise. And the further west you get, Look at Chicago, 109,000 in 1860. Uh, Chicago would have been considered West, and same thing with St. Louis. But Chicago explodes to 1.7 million by 1900. So these places were booming, and, and in a 40-year time period, to see that kind of growth, that's 10 times growth, a little bit more than that, actually. <clears throat> that's got to mess with some things. <clears throat> so if you can imagine being on the street back then, you don't see any automobiles or horses and, and wagons. You imagine every time a horse does its business, it yeah, someone's got to pick it up or step in it. But this is an open-air market, so you could pick up your groceries as you're walking along. And these are probably peasant immigrants that are living off of the wages they made that particular day. These buildings would be called tenement buildings, and they were very tall for the time. So I'm going to get to my point with the height of these buildings in, in just a little bit. But can you imagine living on... Let's see, we got one, two, three, four. The fifth story of this building, maybe there's a sixth story. And you just bought all your groceries at Walmart, except Walmart didn't exist then. And you've got to carry them up six flights of stairs. That's about the maximum distance that anyone would want to live above ground level. Uh, six flights of stairs would have been pretty, uh, pretty bad for most people. <clears throat> so we look at the distribution of rural and urban. Uh, the, the chart, these are difficult to read, and this only goes to 1960 for us. It kind of follows that the, the chart we saw a little bit ago, this one. Kind of similar-ish, except it goes to 1960. But it, it breaks the country down by region. So this is land in uh, agriculture, square miles in hundreds of thousands of square miles. So this is a large area here. And then it shows us the black is population that's rural, and then the lighter color part is population that's urban. And then over time, and it's difficult to see because those little people are there, uh, that starts to shift. You see the shift over here, too. In immigration driving population growth, this is the number of immigrants coming into America uh, during these years. 1930 to 39, anybody have a guess why immigration was down so much during those that decade? Yes, it was the Great Depression. So, first of all, we didn't want anybody coming here because we were already short on jobs. And second, nobody wanted to come here. In fact, when the United States was suffering through our Great Depression, most of the rest of the world was suffering through a depression also. The 20s, booyah, it was booming. And then 1910 to 1919, well, the world was sort of on edge with World War One, uh, World War Two here coming out of the Great Depression. The 50s in America were a pop in time, but we were also a little bit close-minded to opening up our borders to immigrants. 60s into the 70s, the Vietnam War, and 80s, 90s, and 2000s, America has sort of been a shining light for people to head towards, like a bug flying to a bug zapper. When we look at the percentage of immigrants in the 20-year period heading into Ellis Island, um, 1890, a lot of Irish, that number tapers off, uh, Germans, uh, and then we look at uh, we go to 1900 and 1910, we see large numbers of Russians, uh, Hungarians, Austrians, Italians. 
<clears throat> and our numbers of Scandinavians shrink down. So we can tell a lot about history by looking at a chart like this. For instance, um, it's probably safe to say that something was worse in 1900 in Russia than it was in 1890. So we can ask questions. Was it the political leadership? Was there a famine? A shortage of food? Was there a drought? A shortage of water? Uh, was What was luring Russians and Hungarians to America and Italians to America during those time periods? It, it really makes more questions than it does answers, but it would give us a, a reason to do a little bit of research. We're not going to go into that now. <clears throat> a couple of immigrant families. And I always like to look at this picture in particular because when you, you see the, the faces on these young these people, uh, what's missing? Yeah, dad. A lot of times what immigrants would do is the father would head to America and try to establish a place to live and, and try to get a job in the factory, and then he would send for the family. So that could be what's going on here. But you can see by looking at their faces, you know, the two little ones, they're too little to know what's going on. But you can see by the boy here and the mama, that you can see fear, anxiety, maybe even a little excitement. Uh, the unknown is ahead of them. <clears throat> Bread peddlers in 1900, so they're selling loaves of bread on the street, trying to make whatever money they could make. But uh, this picture and the emotion in this picture tells the story to me. So we get to the point now. There are three things that make urban development a possibility. Three things that make urban development a possibility. Okay, the question on your quiz that you're going to see in a little bit is going to ask you what three things allow for the growth of major cities or urban development in America. One is the electric elevator. So once we get electric elevators, six stories didn't matter because you don't have to walk up flights of stairs. Number two is steel construction. <clears throat> so U.S. Steel and Andrew Carnegie were producing huge quantities of steel. If we start to build the frames of our buildings out of steel instead of brick, because brick is strong, <coughs> but with a brick, a normal brick, you could go about five or six stories up and the weight of the building itself would begin to crush the stone or the brick below. With steel construction, it's limitless. So you can go as high as you want because of the electric elevator and the strength of the steel allows us to build as tall as we want. So no longer worried about uh, stacking people into five-story tenements. A tenement is like a rundown apartment building, uh, very, very poor. Uh, so one and two, electric elevator, steel construction. Electric elevator, steel construction. By the way, look at the safety harnesses that those men are wearing. Yeah, they don't have any. No hard hats. No safety helmets. They're just sitting on a beam uh, 50 stories. I don't know how tall that is. Way up in the air um, taking a lunch break. And they were really fast at building stuff too compared to today. <clears throat> but probably more men lost. I can't imagine. So I'm a little bit scared of heights if I don't have anything to hold on to. I can't imagine being this dude. He's just like, eh, nothing, no big deal here. Or this guy sitting out on the edge. You see the in the background here the... Uh, there's a beautiful building, very tall. Uh, but this guy's got a ranch, and he's putting some stuff together. And if he scoots back a few inches, oh, splat. But uh, I guess that happened once in a while. Same thing here with these guys. No safety harnesses. Uh, you can't have a fear of heights to work on these things. So, again, number one is electric elevators. Number two, steel construction. Watch for a few more minutes, and I'll give you number three. The third one was streetcars. This one doesn't fight fit in quite as simply, but in 1900, electric streetcars moved more than 5 billion passengers per year. So you didn't have to live right next to the factory anymore. Later, automobiles will replace the need for streetcars, uh, but public transportation like this. In fact, uh, Omaha used to have electric streetcars, which is awesome. In fact, I can't tell what that one says, but... Uh, and there's been talk uh, by the mayor that someday, maybe in the future, it'd be a great tourist thing to take people to downtown Omaha to bring the streetcars back. But you can live farther away and catch a ride on the electric streetcar. This one's horse-drawn. This one's electric. You can see it's getting its electricity from a wire above. Um, probably not in Omaha because there's palm trees, I guess, so that would make sense. But um, so we got electric elevators, steel construction, and streetcars that make transportation into the factories, into the cities where the work is much, much easier. Here's some Omaha streetcars. Here's what I was looking for. 
Wouldn't it be cool if they ran a, a line from TD Ameritrade down to the zoo? That'd be kind of fun. Omaha's first street car, horse drawn, but catch a ride. Today there's buses. You can go almost anywhere in Omaha on a bus, but it just seems like it'd be kind of cool to ride an old school street car. And we'll move into <coughs> Ellis Island, Angel Island, the tests that immigrants were forced to take or forced to pass and so forth uh, on our next lesson tomorrow. So just to go back before you take your Otis test this morning, as soon as possible, please, we remember these three things. We remember the electric elevator, we remember steel construction, and we remember streetcars. If you got those three things on your brain right now, you can even write them down. Electric elevator, steel construction, and streetcars. Then the, the quiz in Otis is super simple. Uh, miss you guys. Talk to you later. Peace.